Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this webinar style technical presentation of the Royal Institution of Naval Architects, the Institute of Marine Engineering, Science and Technology and Engineers Australia. Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders past and present and emerging. Eric Desjardins is our pre presenter this evening, ladies and gentlemen. He completed a Master of Mechanical Engineering in Paris and a Master of Science in Naval Architecture at the University of Southampton. He joined McConaughey Boats in 2005 and was appointed General Manager of McConaughey's Australian operations in 2015. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll pass you over to Eric Desjardins. Thank you very much, Phil, and uh, thank you, Engineer Australia, for welcoming us and uh, the Arena uh, Royal Institution of Naval Architects. So, um, as Phil said, I work at a company called uh, McConaughey Boats, uh, McConaughey for short, and today I'm going to talk about the construction of uh, advanced composite racing yachts. We'll attach, attack that in a few uh, chapters. Um, so tonight I wanted to talk a bit more about what's going around the actual construction, what's going on behind the curtains before uh, the boat is on the, even on the start line. So we'll talk about how do a project start, um, how we uh, connect with the customer, how do we um, get going uh, on the contract? How we um, tool for um, the custom boat? Uh, bear in mind that when you talk about racing yacht, uh, they are very often uh, bespoke. Uh, you've got a few exceptions where the boats are a production item, but in the vast majority of cases, they are uh, designed for a purpose and built for a purpose and um, very, very one-off. Um, I will speak about the staff and the factory that um, manufactures those yachts. Uh, I'll go into some detail on the actual construction uh, of those racing yachts. Uh, I'll talk about some element of uh, quality control. Um, then I'll speak about uh, the optimization and the refit. So one, the boat is uh, sailing um, after a number of years, there's some repairs sometimes, but sometimes uh, the boat comes back into the yard and uh, get optimized and stay at that uh, leading edge of the competition. Uh, and I'll conclude this presentation for uh, by um, talking about some of the future trends in yacht construction. By no means this is uh, going to be exhaustive, but I was interested in talking about some uh, areas that I can see uh, are developing rapidly. Um, McConaughey is a 50-year-old Australian business, uh, started very uh, low-key, um, you know, uh, John McConaughey out of his garage was building some racing dinghies and the dinghies have become bigger and bigger uh, until uh, probably one of our best known boats is uh, Wild Oats 11, which is a 100 uh, feet uh, maxi racer. Um, and we build those boats from raw elements, from raw ingredients, so to speak. Um, the one thing we don't do is we don't design. So we team up with uh, engineers and with naval architects to, to come up with a, a design. And then when the design is handed over to us, uh, we participate in prototyping, manufacturing, putting everything together. And uh, when we're lucky, we can take the boat out for some sea trials. Um, the first chapter is the feasibility study. So can we do what the customer wants in, in, in the time he wants? So the first, uh, the first item is to uh, understand from the customer what does he want, and we refer to this during the construction by, by the brief. Uh, what is the purpose of the boat? Um, that purpose revolves around the race that the uh, customer has selected or a, a type of race. Um, I'll briefly talk about the design considerations. Uh, that could be a whole presentation in itself and it's not really my place to go in great details, but I thought it was uh, relevant to tonight's presentation. And then I'll um, speak a bit about the timing and the budget of those uh, very early stage in the project. 
Um, I'm assuming most of you are uh, interested in boats, uh, but I also imagine uh, quite a lot are not familiar. So I'll quickly go through some of the races um, you, you can consider if you're ever going to consider a boat. Uh, the first level of racing is twilight racing, and that's very social, that's very relaxed. It's usually on the summer months in the evening. And the main design uh, criteria is, is the ski big enough uh, to accommodate all the drinks and food for the, the race? Uh, it's usually very short. The next level is a club racing, which is a little more competitive um, in saying that depending on which club you're racing at, it can be extremely competitive, um, but it's still a, an aspect of a social, social event. Um, then you get to a, a windward leeward, which is a, a, a defined course and there are short races around those course, or you can go offshore. Uh, a passage race, which is usually, um, you know, 24 hours, just a, a one, one big run. Uh, sometimes it's of a couple of days, but usually pretty short. Um, one element of interest is a one design competition um, where all the boats are identical. Um, so basically that's what you have for Olympic format, um, where whoever wins is the person that is the best sailor. Um, so no arm race on those uh, one design uh, racing boats, um, but a lot of skills. Um, the regattas are a different type of race where you, it could be a week. So uh, an example here in Australia is Hamilton Island Race Week, for example, or the Sail Melbourne or Sail Sydney, which are over several days in a row, but you still get to sleep in your bed at night. Um, the next uh, race is an offshore race. Uh, the most famous one uh, here in Australia is probably a Sydney to Hobart race, but that's one of many and there's plenty around the world, um, which is uh, those, that picture on the right hand side may be familiar to some of you watching the start of the race on the uh, uh, Boxing Day. And then you've got the special races, which is sometimes a blend of all the races I've uh, described before, except the Twilight Racing one. Um, so I want to refer to the America's Cup, which is underway at the moment in Auckland. Um, we can talk about the Volvo race or the Vendée Globe, which are full on offshore uh, racing for months at a time. Um, and uh, I put in there the TP52 circuit, uh, which uh, happened in uh, Mediterranean circuit um, in South of France and, and that kind of area where it's uh, around a few boys and it's, it's highly competitive. This is just to give you a taste that there are race yachts, but there's so many different races. Really, you have to know what are you trying to do. For all those races, the, the success of a race yacht is largely depending on how light it is. So uh, how light do you tell to go? How light do you want to do a structure uh, that's still fit for purpose, that will still let you finish the race? Um, but it's the same for a plane, the same for a race car. The lighter you go, the faster usually you, you can go. Um, the material of choice to achieve that these days, uh, or for the last few decades, is uh, carbon fiber and uh, in an epoxy uh, resin solution. Uh, I will get into more detail in composite in the presentation. Again, there could be a, a whole talk about just composites, so I'll, I'll take a few shortcuts there. Um, Okay, so the designer uh, has been contacted by a customer. Usually the customer goes, I want to win uh, the Sydney to Hobart race, for example. So that straight away answer a few of the questions the designer might have to, uh, to ask. Is it an offshore race? Is it a, uh, uh, inshore? What are the dominant condition? Is it going to be a windy race or light race? A right race, pardon me. Uh, is it a crude uh, boat or is it single-handed like for the Vendée Globe? So that will give you a bit of a background on what type of boat you want. Uh, are there some class rules or uh, regatta rules? An example for the Sydney to Hobart race, it has to be a monohull and it cannot be more than 100 uh, feet in length. Uh, then there's a whole set of regulations. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of work done around uh, getting to ISO standards, specifically around the keel area, around the, the structural area of the boat, make sure those boats are safe, uh, you know, again, designer will try to save on the weight and sometimes the, the boats become not uh, safe enough. And unfortunately, accident happens. So regulation is trying to curb this. 
when all those parameters have been considered, the naval architect start its job of what is the shape of the boat that will perform the best, uh, both from a hydrostatic point of view, but also a hydrodynamic point of view and the performance in waves, the performance from an aerodynamics point of view. So that, that's a very specific knowledge. Um, and us as a construction uh, yeah, I'm going to get a, a glimpse of it, but um, that's a lot of background work that goes on um, before the, the boat starts its life. Um, usually, uh, engineering, uh, composite engineer is involved at some stage. Uh, it, not every stage is they are involved. Um, sometimes it's in-house for the naval architecture, but it's so specific uh, that a lot of naval architects subcontract with the engineers. The engineers will absorb the dynamic loads uh, from the uh, and naval architect and will make their own um, assumptions, um, their own safety margin, they'll look at the class roles and, and they come up with a, a, a sound design. Um, one of the key elements of racing is to finish first. First, you have to finish. You need to be able to be in a reliable boat. The last aspect of design before you, you launch in a new design would be what is the development on appendages, on cells, on masts, on equipment with uh, what new electronics. Um, for example, appendages, well, with America's Cup, you may be familiar that a lot of uh, race yachts are now evolving towards foiling um, hydrofalls, uh, which allow the boat to, to glide uh, mostly above the water. And although hydrofall technology is ancient, it's only really in the last 15, 20 years that um, the construction methodology in carbon fiber allows sailing yachts to be uh, competitive in, in sailing. So I, I cut short here on the design, but basically out of those studies, um, sometimes uh, basically I want a, a boat like Wild Oats. It, it's the answer to that studies, um, but generally it's a new custom design. So it, it's bespoke with its own sail plan drawing, showing the shape of the sail and the size of the sails. It has its own deck plan, uh, had a bit of uh, interior general arrangement, showing how many cabins, if any, the structure inside the boat, um, what sort of appendages we need to allow for, um, the weight study, the bill of material, how much carbon is going to go into this boat. And in some case, but not always, we have some very detailed specification. Uh, I worked on a boat in the past that says all the composite material needs to be carbon fiber, all the bolts needs to be titanium, and, and so on and so forth. So it really depends on which designer you're working on, and you have quite a detailed set of information or, or very minimal. <clears throat> Once we've got the design, is now the, yard, uh, the designer will send that to a few yards to have a look and, and come back to them, uh, to the customer about, is it possible to build a boat in a time frame? So as I said, usually a boat is designed a specific race. So can you be on the start of the race? Can, do you have enough time to build a boat? Otherwise it defeat the purpose. Um, and then how much is that going to cost? So we're still very early days uh, and somehow we have to come up with a, uh, a bit of a ballpark both on the time and the cost uh, for the, the the customer to say yes, I want I want this boat. So how long does it take to build a boat? Depends on the length of the boat. It's the most honest answer. And on the right hand side here, I have a typical duration for a 45 footer, uh, which is about nine months from from start to finish on the truck. Um, as the boat grow in sizes, it grows in volume and becomes more complex uh, to achieve. Uh, so it's not quite linear for a 60 foot racer you allow for a year. And if you get to a, a boat like uh, Alfa Romeo, a hundred footer, you allow for 16 months. Um, a couple of notable exceptions, Waldos were able to be built in nine months. And uh, the TP52 all for one, which I'll uh, use in later on in the presentation uh, as an illustration. Um, we like to talk about it, but we don't want to do it again. We built that one in three months and that was a lot of hard work, uh, a, a lot of long hours. Um, as a comparison, uh, those boats I just mentioned are only race yachts, which means they're quite barren inside, uh, very minimal interior. 
Um, as a comparison, if you uh, want to build a performance cruiser with some creature comfort and, a, I don't know, a teak deck and air conditioning, and uh, you have to allow almost another year on top of the structure. Uh, the, the devil is in the details, and there are a lot of uh, little details on those boats. Um, um, how much does it cost to build a racing yacht? I cannot give you a proper answer. I can tell you how much work goes into it. That's a bit icy here. Um, so it ranged from anything from 15,000 hours to 70,000 hours, depending on the size of the boat. Um, to build a 45 footer, you probably need a team of 10 people uh, to achieve that in the nine months. And if you go to a maxi like Wild Oats, you need on average uh, 30 people. So um that's over the last uh, the whole year and a half um the composite material cost varies again depending on the size of the boat but it's a good good chunk of the of the price of the boat varying from um just north of two hundred thousand dollars for uh, a, a, a small boat uh to up to a million dollar for a, a maxi yacht uh i don't know the full cost of the boat because it's only the tip of the iceberg I haven't discussed design fees, uh, rigging, sail, safety gear. Uh, does the boat need to go to the US like uh, most of uh, the boat we're building at the moment or is it staying here in Sydney? And this is all just to get the boat in the water. Then you have the ongoing cost, uh, the maintenance. Uh, in some cases, the crew, you have to, to pay the professional crew and, and so on and so forth. So this is all going behind the scenes before we even start about building the boat. Um, so how do we start building a boat? Um, the first thing to keep in mind is who are you building this boat with? Uh, who are the shareholders? So obviously you've got the owner, uh, he or, or she, um, but more often it's a he, have select a, a, selected a naval architect and the naval architects recommend a few yards, but ultimately the owner will make his decision uh, based on track record and, and other elements. We usually don't have a contractual arrangement with a naval architect. We just have a common customer that we want to keep excited about the build and, and happy during the build. Um, to, to be a realist, when I describe the type of work I do, I describe that I'm in the entertainment business with the, the type of boat we do uh, for uh, people to enjoy the racing. So you want the whole experience to be uh, to, to be a success, uh, the owner has to enjoy the, the build process as well. Um, the other people involved in the build are the specialists. So uh, hydraulic, electronic, uh, sail maker, mass maker, there's too many to, to name, but um, you get the ID. Uh, when the owner selects a yard, uh, he might elect a, a turnkey solution. Um, some of our customer have approached us and said, look, I only want to talk to my Konaki during the build. And if anything goes bad after the build, I still want to be picking up one from the, call one person and we want everything to work. Uh, the other side of the spectrum is a, what I call the bare boat. It's not a technical term, but it reflects that some owner have a whole uh, team of professional sailors that are fully capable of uh, assembling the boat. So in those cases, my Koneki job is to build a, a structure uh, a, a painted structure and then uh, assemble all the equipment selected by the by the team. So we would not pick up the, select the mass, for example, but we will install it. Um, contractual, we don't always have a contract. Uh, we generally have one, uh, but you'll be surprised um, how far you can go with just a, a, an agreement of, okay, this is roughly where we're going. This is uh, uh, the parameters and um, you have to to de develop the trust with the customer and, and, and take him on that journey. Um, some area of the boat at this stage are not defined at all. And because it's a race yacht, um, you want to be on that competitive edge. So you may not have uh, done this boat before. The example I've selected on this slide is a, a 42 feet uh, boat that we built in 2009. Uh, designed by Rock Capu in, in, the, in the US for a, a local customer here in Sydney. And you may have heard of boat with a canting keel. Um, this was is an extreme canting keel, as you can see. The boat is flat, but the keel is outside of the water. And if you change tack, if you change side, the keel goes back in the middle 
and then goes back on the other side. Sounds simple, very difficult to achieve. Uh, and certainly when we started the, the project, it was just a concept. It, it wasn't really a, a final design. I think we had the final design the day after we launched the boat. So how do you handle that on the contract side where you handle, you handle that with PC sum or, or do in charge areas? We literally put in a uh, contract for this boat that anything uh, on the right hand side here on the little sketch, anything around the keel in red has to be uh, priced as a, as a do and charge at a, at a cost plus area. From this agreement and you know this team you assemble around the build, including the owner, sometimes the owner's rep uh, representative, if uh, the, the, the person is not available or, or lives um, overseas, um, you kick off the project. Basically, the naval architect and engineer will issue a bill of material. Um, from that bill of materials, straight away you order the material. Uh, I'm referring here to composite materials. Those composite materials are not on the shelf ready to go when you place an order. Uh, you, you'd be lucky to have a few rolls of carbon in a container here in uh, Australia when you start, but the reality is you have to place an order and you have to wait up to two months before you have them at your doorstep. Which is fine because during those two months, the naval architect is hard at work to issue the hull lines and the engineer hard at work to issue the hull construction drawing and, and the rest of the of the design. So the, the race has started at this point. And as soon in the ideal world, you want the material to arrive the day after you finish the tooling and you want the drawing maybe a day, uh, sorry, a week or two before you start manufacturing so you can plan your work. Um, so that ordering material is really the start of the project and the first two main milestones is when you demold the hull. At that stage, usually you have the, the shell as one big structure and the, all the interior um, structure has been manufactured, ready to be installed. In parallel, you can start the deck and then, you know, nearly five months after you had the, the kickoff, uh, you have the deck on, which is the end of the main structure, and then you move into the, the painting and, and the fitting area. Um, the main driver on the time frame and the cost is, can the design stay ahead of the build? Um, a lot of work we do in the office uh, at McConaughey or the naval architect or the project manager is make sure that the, the staff knows how to build the boat on the production floor, and we are a supporting activity to make sure they have the information and, and they have the material to, to build the boat. Right, so tooling. So the blessing of composite materials is you can do any shape. The curse is uh, you need something to make that shape. So essentially in the, you need something to make a part. Uh, that tooling, uh, so the, the hull mold, for example, the deck mold and had a mold, you, you name it. Uh, there, there's hundreds of molds to be made in producing a, a yacht. Uh, I will focus on the main item, which is a hull, which is uh, built in uh, one, one size. So you have to think for wild oats that 30 meter by five and a half meter wide by about four meter high shell uh, that you, you manufacture in, in one hit. When you get to manufacture a tool, you have to think about what material are you going to use? Um, is that material that you use at ambient temperature or are you going to uh, heat them at uh, a temperature of uh, 100 degrees? Uh, well, it won't be the same mold, uh, depending on the answer to that question. You have to think of how many times are you going to use the mold? As I explained, uh, the, the yacht we're talking about here, usually it's a one-off, even um, 100 footers uh the, the subtle changes from one to another means you have to restart the tooling from scratch uh you have to think about the accuracy um we we work to the millimeter for those big items uh such as the deck and the hull if you get into the intricacy of a canting keel uh you need a, a, a far more accurate tooling uh you have to think do you want to go for a male or female tooling so in other words which side of the composite do you want to mold um this also impact the level of the surface finish. So for a hull, you, you probably want to have a female mold uh, and control the outside finish. So when you get to paint and fair, you already started with a very smooth surface. If the inside is a little bit uh, 
um, and even because of the buildup of uh, laminate, that, that's okay, you can usually take care of it later down the track. Um, the last aspect of the tooling is you want the tooling to be airtight. Um, that's part of the construction process, um, which uh, you can see on the bottom right here. Uh, you've got this vacuum bag that will consolidate all the uh, material onto the mold. I'll get to that back in a minute. Um, so here, <coughs> go through the few, next few slides talking about how to build a female mold. So you start with uh, a base jig, uh, that's the top right picture here, and that will give you a nice horizontal surface. You, you can see it's been packed on the floor to make sure that top surface is level. You can just barely see here a center line uh, string, uh, so you define the center line of the boat and then you'll define a, a station. So between the horizontal plane, the centerline plane, and the, the section, you define your reference, and everything will be measured from that reference. You can see on that top picture the frames that have been cut for the mold. So what we do here, we take the 3D from the architect, and we slice it, say, every 600 millimeters, and you create all those different sections, and, and then you set them up uh, on the jig. Uh, which is the bottom left picture. When you set up all the frame, you run those long stringers and on the right hand side you can see all the stringers have been laid down and you start uh, the planking process which is a, a thin plywood of maybe three millimeters that you plank and generate that surface. Um, this is only one way of making the mold. It's a traditional way. It's cost effective. Bear in mind we're only going to use this mold once, maybe twice if you're lucky and have two orders with the same boat. But uh, over the years, you cannot, you just cannot keep all those molds, so they'll be uh, chopped up, uh, and uh, um, the room will be made to start the next design. Um, this is what the female mold looks like when it's finished. So you can see we have inside the mold a uh, center line. We've got the station um, I mentioned before, which is a uh, uh, athwart ship uh, reference and we've got our water line, which is our, our horizontal plane. Um, this tape will stay in the mold when we start laminating, so when we release the hull, we have this reference pretty much scribed into the, the composite material, so we can then assemble the boat very accurately using those uh, measurements. Here on the first uh, part of the picture, you can see uh, a plant that's part of the mold, and in this occasion here, that will be where the keel sockets inside the boat. So. We take great care in having the keel on the center line, and also you can see we are making sure this is all plumb and, and true. We have a mold, we're ready to start laminating. What are we using to laminate? Oh, sorry, uh, other tooling solutions. So you could go to the next level, which is uh, uh, machining and aluminum tooling. So you do that if you're Boeing and you have to make a lot of wings for the same plane again and again. Um, it costs an absolute fortune, but uh, is worth it in the long run. Um, this is simply not doable for a race yacht. Um, you can do epoxy tooling boards, similar, uh, that will be reserved for smaller parts like rudder, same with aluminum tooling. You'll keep that for the very critical parts uh, that need uh, extreme consolidation, maybe up to four bars of consolidation. Um, if you're not using temperature sensitive material, you can use a foam tooling uh, for hand laminating at ambient temperature. And um, in the last five to 10 years, we started using uh, small 3D printed molds. Um, very, very humble uh, application. The molds are not very big, but that's definitely uh, used more and more. If you um, are considering high quality molds. Uh, this infused carbon tooling is a possibility. You've got uh, an example on those slides. Uh, you still have to make a pattern very much in the same way that I described in the previous slide, except in this case, it's a male um, mold. And then you infuse layers of carbons uh, on top of the shape. So on the right hand side here, you can see um, the carbon is in hidden under this uh, vacuum bag, the blue bag, and you've got all those pipes feeding the resin um, and, and making sure you've got your um, composite, material, composite mold finished. Um, I'll quickly talk about the staff and the factory. So it takes many talents to build uh, a, a race yachts, uh, a lot of teamwork. 
mostly sheep rides, trained sheep rides, so th usually through TAFE and uh, I guess it takes a little bit of, of madness or, or passion, you pick which one you want to talk about, um, to build boats. Um, we also have pattern makers, spray painters, uh, we touch a bit on the CNC machining or mold. Uh, there's a lot of uh, tasks that can be accomplished by uh, laborers and apprentices, so especially in the uh, laminating when it's uh, draping down uh, pre-preg or, or finishing the, the painting of the boat, that's very labor intensive. Uh, we have project managers uh, and engineers and naval architects uh, that assist uh, the project manager and, and, uh, and the crew on the production floor. Um, <clears throat> this is a quick view of the factory I'm, I'm calling from, uh, McConaughey on the central coast. Um, you can just have a little peek in there. Well, so what we can see is a, a boat that we finished back in, in June, uh, 44 feet. Uh, we can just see um, the oven here, which uh, can be extended to 30 meter long, so we can uh, accommodate a boat like Wild Oats. And you can see a fin here that's going to go on this boat that during the uh, painting process. And here you can see the stack of frames of a female mold for the next project waiting to be installed in the oven. Um, so our, our bread of butter is really this main oven, which is, as I say, 30 meter long, it's eight meter wide, and it's about four and a half meter high. So it's a decent size oven to make very large uh, structuring in one hit. Um, this is an example of a boat we produced in 2005. It started its life uh, as uh, Wild Oats. Pardon me, as Alfa Romeo, a uh, um, near sister ship to Wild Oats, and is now back in Australia after a short stint in Europe, and is called Blackjack. So you've probably seen it on the start line of the Sydney to Hobart race. Now, we've got a mold, uh, we've got the team, we've got a design, we've got the materials. Um, I'll probably go a bit quickly here on the composite material. I'm happy to take questions uh, at the end if you have any queries on the composite material. Um, it's basically fibers and, and resin. The fiber gives the mechanical strength uh, in tension uh, and the resin keeps all the, the fiber orientated and, and as one item. So carbon fiber, glass fiber, Kevlar uh, and more uh, exotic uh, fiber like Dyneema or, or biofibers. Uh, the resin can be epoxy, vinyl ester, polyester, they all have their uses. Um, a variety of coal can be used as well. And to add the combination, you've got different brands of fiber, different weights of fiber, different ways of stitching the fiber. Uh, you can use different fillers for the resin. For example, uh, if you need flame retardant product, you can mix that in the resin. Um, and then you have different manufacturing processes. So you have uh, Reese on the right hand side here doing a wet laminate on the, on the beam. Um, that's hand consolidated with, uh, you know, you brush in the resin and you uh, make sure everything's consolidated. And uh, Alex and Andrew here are laying down some uh, pre-preg. This is the start of a, of a bulkhead uh, on the table. So um, your head is probably spinning with all the uh, ways of using composite material. It's very simple in practice. We're using carbon fiber and epoxy resin. And 80% of the time we use that in a, in a pre-preg form, which is the resin and the fiber are mixed by a machine. You've got the perfect ratio between the fiber and the resin, and the resin has a catalyst in there, which reacts very slowly at room temperature. I'm talking about two weeks before the uh, reaction really starts. So it gives you plenty of time to manipulate that fiber, uh, that pre-preg fiber. And uh, when you're ready, when you've laminated all uh, your fiber on the mold, you can set up your vacuum bag and you can uh, cook the part in the oven at about uh, 100 degrees. It's a long cook. Uh, it takes about 10, hour, 10 to 16 hours to cook a part. And you do it two or three times until you have the, the finished part. This is a bit more example. Uh, you can see the carbon prepreg uh, you can see two different colors. So it, it comes on a roll. You can see that on the bottom corner of the picture. And uh, depending if it's unidirectional um, or if it's a, an off axis, 
and depending on the weight, there's a bit of a color coding happening. So you can see the beauty with uh, uh, composite material is you can really line it up with uh, the structure you're trying to achieve. So uh, a, a block of steel, if it's not forged, has the same uh, mechanical uh, properties in all directions. It's isotropic. Well, with uh, composite material, you can really design the material to match uh, the requirement of your structure. So uh, you've got designer going to great lengths about Oh, I want this fiber to be at plus minus 46 degrees and uh, this one at 83 degrees. So uh, it, they keep us on our toes when, when we lay up uh, all this fiber. Um, you can probably see on this roll, it's quite thin. So each layer of carbon is only maybe half a millimeter thin. In some cases, 0.3 of a millimeter thin. So again, it's very labor intensive laying all those layers in the correct orientation, one after another. Make sure you don't forget any uh, and uh, make sure you use uh, the, the right material. These slides show uh, the the black is actually the outside skin of the hull that's been laminated and, and cured independently. And now it's time to fit the core. So you have two types of core on this picture. You have uh, a foam core here, uh, which is in a, in a slamming area, which is uh, highly loaded in the boat. And then you've got honeycomb core here, uh, for the rest of the boat, uh, again, it's a bit of a jigsaw puzzle, very labor intensive, make sure it's all, all fitted. On this boat, we elected to um, pretty much almost strip plank and, and tightly fit all those panels. Uh, on some boat in the past, we have preform both the Nomex and the core, um, which is, is doable, it's just another step in the process. And, and will make uh, the structure lighter again. Um, this is what the hull looks like when it's fully cured, outside skin, core and inside skin. And now it's time to set up all the bulkheads um, and all the longitudinal structure. Um, they're built in parallel to the hull on the table, again, uh, mostly using pre preg material. Um, you can just make uh, the shade of a bulkhead here. You've got some beams being prepared and then they get um, identified and weighed um, and uh, assemble in the boat. Um, I'm going a bit quickly here, but happy to take uh, any question at the end. So from this shell, you're now to uh, a structure that becomes a bit of a grid. So a lot of the work done by the designer is calculating how big or how small the panel need to be. And, and then create uh, the uh, adequate structure around it. Uh, if some areas are highly loaded, then you can have additional um, patching and, and change the thickness of the composite material there to uh, achieve your goal. Um, inside the boat here, you can see again, very labor intensive anywhere where you see those green tapes, it's preparation for what we call secondary bonding, which is uh, hand laminated, you can see the, here the, the carbon and the resin has been uh, pre, uh, pre, I mean, just mixed uh, before being laid down carefully. And then you uh, put a vacuum bag again, you have an example here at the front of that bulkhead uh, being consolidated by um, pulling vacuum onto the job. While you're busy putting all the bulkhead and the structure inside the shell, another team is building the deck uh, in the oven. And at some stage, the, uh, that's a deck on uh, milestone. Um, I mentioned before, that's really um, when the hull become um, structural and, and start the, the next stage of the project, which is uh, fitting everything together. Um, here's an example of a rig attachment. Again, you can really design, there's a lot of uni strands here, a lot of unidirectional going wrapping around. Um, this fitting can take tons, ten, tens of uh, thousands of kilos, uh, easy. Um, it's holding the mast up, you know, the sails are enormous on some of those boats. This is a chain plate at the back of uh, wild oats on the transom holding the mast up, um, fighting again the spinnaker. The, the, the code zero on wild oats is nearly a thousand square meter. So it, uh, some of the load are just um, in, insane. It's amazing how strong um, the carbon fiber can be when it's used uh, and manufacture in the right way. Okay, so we have a structure now, we're starting the paint process. Um, a lot of boats have to perform and they also have to look good. Uh, some of them have sponsors on them um, and 
it's part of the life of the boat. Uh, it's part of the reason people come to Maconaki is also the attention to detail and the, 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 the general look of the boat. Um, and um, that we respecting the designer wish in um, building uh, a boat that is true to their design. Um, this is a quick view on the same boat that TP52, uh, sponsored by Audi, um, before all the winches uh, get assembled. This is the uh, deck fitting area. You can see the tools of the trade here, making sure everything's sealed, every single bolt needs to be sealed so the boat stays watertight. It's always good on the boat to keep the water out. Um, this is, again, very labor intensive. The, the structure, in a way, is a straightforward bit. It's all the ropes, all the winches, all the fit out. That's what really takes time in uh, manufacturing a boat. Eventually, you put it on a truck. And from the truck, uh, you carry it onto a ship. So this one was sent to Europe. Uh, this is a boat we built in three months. So we had one month for the tooling, one month for the building all the structure, and one month to assemble all the structure and do all the fitting. The saving grace is all the design was made. Uh, that boat was an exact sister ship to a boat being built in, uh, in Europe at the time. So we were able to really start with a set of completed drawings. And the other saving grace is this is a pure race yacht. It's just raw carbon inside. I don't think it was even painted inside. It was um, very, very barren, very spartan. After a few months at sea, it arrived in Europe, gets assembled. And uh, on occasion, well, not last year because of COVID, but we do send teams overseas to assist with the boat. Um, this specific boat had never seen the keel. The keel was manufactured in Europe. The mast was built uh, in New Zealand. Um, the, uh, the three items were never assembled together. So uh, usually you anxiously wait the the phone call about is everything went well or is there a problem? The key is for all the shareholders, everyone involved to work from the same drawings, obviously, and that any change is tracked and uh, communicated. So um, that constant communication is what makes those uh, assembly uh, relatively um, painless. And then it's time to race. Um, so this is the same boat we've been looking at uh, in action. At the end of the day, this is what's this is what it is about. That's what keeps me uh, interested in in this business. Is uh, uh, they're pretty pretty cool machines. Um, a little word about quality control. I touched base on this briefly at the beginning. Um, there's a huge focus on weight saving. So are we uh, the designer goes to great lengths to design the lightest structure possible, and then we have to make sure we use the right materials. So it's as light as possible. We have to make sure we save weight wherever we can. You know, uh, I mentioned going to titanium bolt. Well, that's an option on some projects. Um, constant focus on weight. Uh, this picture here is a, a small dinghy called a moth. Uh, I believe some of you in the attendance have been sailing on uh, those boats quite um, assiduously. Uh, again, they've got hydrofall. So when they get to about uh, eight knots of speed, they uh, take off and um, they achieve, I think the maximum speed on one of those is around 40 knots, which is uh, you need to wear a helmet if you're doing that kind of speed. The whole structure, including the sail, uh, not including the sailor, but the whole boat ready to go sailing is 30 kilos. Um, so that's done by using all carbon everywhere um, and and very, very thin carbon. So. Um, uh, those boats get they do get trashed around and you all always repair them but that's par for the course for that specific type of boat um, back to the maxi and the boat like wild oats or, or the tp52 our job in the yard is to always communicate back to the designer so we we weigh the boat at different steps uh, the the 56 under uh, construction right now here in the shed uh, we're going to get great lengths in a couple of weeks to weigh the boat and then report back uh, to the designer. Uh, make sure they have allowed um, enough margin in their weight calculation. Uh, if you build a part and you have the weight, that's probably not good news. You probably forgot half of the laminate or, or something gone wrong in the process. So this is a simple metric, but it's so important, so important. Um, so the other quality control is we um, I've put a few pictures here. 
uh, the stop picture here is uh, 3D scanning of the hull. Um, this is the plug we use to infuse the mold. So uh, a carbon infused mold can be uh, very expensive, uh, half a million dollar kind of expensive. So you want to make sure the shape is right before you pull the, the mold. Um, here on the right hand side, we've got a bit of a record of when have we used the prepreg, how long has that stayed outside uh, of the freezer, when did it come back? Again, we have a limited window to use this prepreg. Um, here we've got uh, a record of uh, how long was a cook, the temperature, we've got a record as the vacuum, uh, did that hold during the, uh, the cook, uh, which is also a key metric. And in some cases, we go to destructive testing. So obviously we're not going to test the, the hull, but what we do is we laminate the hull a bit longer and we cut off a panel at the end and, and test that. Um, so yes, where appropriate, we do destroy or, or fire test some of those um, materials. <clears throat> Um, that was an interesting refit. So Weldots was launched in 2005 um, and in 2015 the owner approached us asking how do we modernize uh, the hull and, and keep that competitive. They were under stiff competition from a, a boat called Comanche and you may remember that a few years ago, about six years ago. And um, the solution was to move the keel and the mast in the boat aft by two meters. Uh, it's a canting keel on the wild oats and this area we're talking about is the backbone of the boat. So pretty quickly between everyone involved, including the designer, we came up to the conclusion it was easier to move the boat around the keel structure and the mast rather than try to move the keel and mast uh, inside the boat. So we ended up doing uh, what we refer to as a, a big nose job. So cut, cut off the existing structure, uh, bear in mind wild oats uh, this was in 2015 and World Ops 1 in 2014, so there was a lot of discussion about, you are sure, you want us to cut. Once once we cut, we can put it back together, but it's it's cut, it won't be the same. Um, so this is down at uh, on Hunter's Hill in Woolwich Dock. Uh, there was a cut, uh, then the boat went back into our factory and we uh, we manufacture a new a new front. So to gain the two meters at the front, we had to cut the boat back nearly back to the mast. So um, nearly, in, not quite in half, but uh, a, a bit more than a third. And here you have the perfectly finished um, structure, polished metallic finish uh, that you know uh, Wild Oats is uh, known for. And this brand new structure in carbon fiber and, and a boat builder wondering how it's going to make the two meet at this stage. Uh, again, enormous time pressure. This picture was taken in September and the race is in December um, and the boat uh, needs to be sailing for a, a period of time so the crew can uh, retune everything. So huge, huge pressure. Um, this is some of the detail and I couldn't resist showing you some of the, the detail uh, on Wild Oats. Uh, Steve Moxham on the picture here uh, was one of the uh, original partner with John McConaughey of this of this company. He's uh, recently retired after 46 years working at McConaughey. So that just show you a bit of the, the passion of the the people uh, working that industry. Um, and this is a solid piece of carbon, um, it, the bobstay connecting the tip of the bowsprit back to the front of the boat. Um, I wouldn't be able to tell you the load from top of my head, but it's um, 100 tons, it's enormous. Um, and still has to, to look the part at the end of the day uh, for those uh, type of boats. And then you're back racing. So the, the part we're looking was just here at the front. This is a solid carbon bit I was talking about. And uh, luckily enough, you cannot tell where the cut is. This is a boat sailing after the cut, you can see Original, this was the forward end of the boat. Um, so this is a, the extension and to make that extension, we had to cut back here. And because I mentioned earlier, this length cannot change. It's a hundred foot maximum. Well, after we added the two meters at the front, what we had to do is uh, cut two meters at the back. And uh, Ishi is ready to, um, to go racing for the, for the Sydney Hobart. Um, this covered a little bit of 
uh, what I know, and now I'm going to venture in the bits I don't really know, but I can see coming uh, with my crystal ball. Uh, so additive technology is still it's interesting the development, and you can see some motorboats 3D printed. They're fairly um, small, so to speak, 25 feet, and also uh, I'm not sure they're quite adapted to race yachts, which are uh, under specific. Uh, loads and have to be extremely, extremely weight, um, uh, you know, focus on weight saving. So this could be a long term evolution, um, but I could be wrong, but I don't see that in the short term. Uh, in the short term, I do see more and more 3D printing tooling. So that could be interesting rather than to go to that uh, level of fairing and cutting timber. Maybe there's a, a potential for 3D printing molds. Uh, automatized fiber placement. This is not futuristic. This is real. This is happening. Uh, it has been happening for a long time in aviation. Uh, essentially, that's a picture here on the right where you have a, a robotic arm that could be on the on the, on rails, depending on the size of the part, and meticulously applies very thin strip of carbon one after another and consolidate and cure as it goes. Um, this is a, a foil that was used for a a Van der Globe, so it's quite quite big. It's about uh, roughly three meters by two meters by one meter. Um, a part like this takes five months to be built with the robot. Um, the good news is you uh, you're very accurate, and also it's very reliable because it's uh, <laughs> it depends so much on the on the um, individual to do that right. Um, Another way of uh, progress is the stored power. Um, the loads on welders are uh, huge. We mentioned that. So you have a lot of uh, hydraulic on board. Uh, the hydraulic is powered by diesel, which is a little bit counterintuitive for a sailing yacht, but that's the reality of those, uh, um, those monsters. Um, on smaller boats, we start to see uh, electrical uh, power packs and uh, or straight uh, electrical motors uh, replacing hydraulic is not quite there yet. It's it's reserved for um, day sailors, or if you want uh, for offshore boats, then what you have is uh, you have a, a generator uh, running on diesel, so it, it, it's more of a hybrid. So for long passages, you still rely on diesel, but for short uh, inside course, well you use the battery during the day and you recharge uh, at night. Um, another um, area of uh, improvement is, is really on the data collection. Um, I couldn't resist but put a bit of an anecdote here for uh, the sensors in the America's Cup on the, on the type of boats racing now in Auckland, uh, where you have about a thousand sensors and they uh, record 100 points per second. And then they send that to uh, the chase boat that uh, absorbed. And at the end of the race uh, or the training day, you can really uh, go into the nitty gritty. So you know the load applied to uh, the winch handles by the uh, the sailors. You know their heart rate, the level of effort. You also have uh, fiber optic embedded in uh, the mast or in the hydrofoil. So you, you can have all this knowledge on loads and, and how to tune the boat. Um, this is still far stretch in the type of boat we've been involved with on, on a regular basis, um, but I can see that becoming more and more important and, and giving more um, a bit of an edge for the crew able to fine tune their boat and, and give the engineers more knowledge about the dynamic loads which will in turn allow them to take a bit more, uh, reduce maybe the safety margin or or maybe increase the safety margin on, on some of the loads um, as well and make the boat more uh, reliable. Um, raw materials, uh, both for the structural parts and the cells. Well, a lot of the material we use now have been in use for quite a while. I'm talking decades, but who knows, you know, maybe uh, nano carbon tubes will keep on developing and, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, we are on constant talk to uh, material manufacturers about what uh, uh, what do they have uh, that, that could uh, give uh, our customer an edge. Um, and then I can see the from a construction point of view, we, we mentioned that a lot of um, 
the work we do is very labor intensive and uh, very physical. So if you can develop a robot that help you fairing the hull or, or you know, assisting with the brute force and, and have the, the staff being the brains and, and the robot being the, the muscle, um, we're not there yet, but that's definitely something worth uh, investigating. Okay, well, um, that's it for now. Uh, I've left some of details if you want to come for a visit or if you want a bit more details. And uh, we'll move now to the, the question and answer part of the presentation. Thank you very much for uh, listening to uh, this presentation. And uh, yeah, go ahead if you have any questions. Oh, well, well, thank you, Eric. Uh, the first question comes from uh, Scott Clarkson. And he says, my question is, how do you predict and model such dynamic and excessive impact loads in hull and keel design? Um, that's a good question. Um, there, there's been a lot of uh, trial and errors, unfortunately, um, that have been, uh, this is more a design question, so I'm not sure if I'm the best person placed to answer it, but I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, it goes down to some safety uh, margin and, uh, uh, for the America's Cup foil, I can talk about that where they build uh, a full version of it and they tested it uh, under fatigue and, and dynamic load. So where you can, you um, try to link your model to uh, real, uh, real measurement. Um, full size is not always possible, so you, you use models. Uh, another example is uh, when you early days when trying to understand the, the friction on the boat, you, you go for a, a towing tank facility. Um, ju just again, you, you want to model. So it, it does not always give you uh, absolute um, data, but it gives you relative uh, information for, for you to optimize. And uh, uh, specifically on the keel, they do have a lifetime and they do have recommended inspection, uh, whether with uh, ultrasound or, or um, yeah, x-ray. Okay. Um, the next one comes from, oh, I think it's Scott Clarkson again. He says, we, we experienced hull delamination in an offshore race on a TP-52 about 18 months ago after falling off a three to four meter wave. It sounds like a comment rather than a question, but do you have any comment to make on it? No, it's fair enough. So um, the TP-52, uh, they started their life as a trans-Pacific type of boat from uh, San Francisco to uh, uh, Honolulu. And um, they become really competitive and uh, there's been a circuit developing in, in the Mediterranean. So, they're not quite watertight and they're not quite offshore uh, capable right off the mark. Um, what happens uh, in practice is some of those boats get purchased second hand and brought back uh, in Australia or, or even if they're built uh, from scratch, then there's an element of redesign and adding frames and uh, adding additional structure and making the, the deck more waterproof. Um, so the delamination could be a, a manufacturing fault, uh, definitely, uh, or it could be if the boat has had uh, an impact, maybe there's a small area uh, a delamination that appeared and no one really noticed and then uh, in, in slamming load, which are one of the main um, dangerous load uh, for, for a boat, especially in three meter seas, um, will just expand, the delamination will just expand. So it could be a small problem undetected that becomes a, a bigger problem, or it could be a, a design uh, a bit too close to the edge that should, in hindsight, have uh, additional frames. Bear in mind there are race yachts. So um, on some programs, uh, if you go out at sea and you don't break anything, that means the boat is uh, uh, over-engineered to an extent, uh, a bit like the Formula ones. So uh, you don't want anything to break during the race, but uh, you do want the boat to be uh, at, the, at the limit to give you that uh, weight uh, advantage. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Dave Lee, and it says, how early is the feasibility of manufacturing considered during design? Does design drive options? 
uh, hang on, I've lost it. Uh, drive options or manufacturing, and how often does it change? Um, very early in the day, you get a phone call from the Naval architect saying roughly how much and how long to build a boat like this one. That that would be a, a neat way to start if the design is not too. Uh, too crazy, um, and usually we, we've done enough boat in the past that we can sort of uh, have a reasonable uh, uh, estimate. Um, definitely, it's driven by the design: how big the boat, uh, how how long, how wide, uh, what sort of appendages. You know, we discussed the canting keel, the extreme canting keel, or the foils. Um, during manufacture, usually the the die is cast a little bit. Um, we uh, had one boat where very close to the end, maybe three quarters through the build, the designer came back saying, actually, we, we want to change the hull shape. Um, so the, the picture I showed welders being cut and new parts made and new parts spliced. Um, that can happen and yes, add cost and, um, and time to the build. But again, it's a ratio. So if the designer comes back to you, say, look, uh, the boat you're building is great, but to win the race, I think we need to go further. Um, well, that, that's what uh, the customer is usually prepared to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one comes from Esan, and he says, Eric, talk about material availability. I worked on a defense project to manufacture uh, an RHIB. It was pre-designed. We simply could not start the manufacturing as the class certified foam was not available. Sourcing material at the beginning is a challenge. That's Again, absolutely that correct. Like a, sounds like a comment. Absolutely correct. In, in some cases too, we're competing. Um, so when the uh, Airbus 380 started to be manufactured, uh, I don't know, that would have been what, 10 years ago, or maybe a bit more. All of a sudden, there was a, a specific fiber that we use all the time that was not as available anymore, and 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 we had to find work around because that was specified in the in the plane, and you know they this uh, gobbled up the whole production. Uh, the honeycomb we use is manufactured uh, in uh, in Europe, and uh, yeah, there's a long lead time. So absolutely getting that material order. So basically, you place the order of material. Uh, before you have a detailed design. So there's an element of risk of not ordering, ordering the right material, but you, you work with the engineers so they don't stray too much off what they specified. And of course, you've got option to tweak the design a little bit. And if you just talk about a few rolls or uh, a few square meter of, uh, uh, of uh, structural foam, then you can go around it. But clearly the, the fundamental cannot change. Otherwise, you simply cannot get that uh, in time. You know, it's it's manufactured overseas and it's manufactured on on, on order most of the time. Okay, thanks. Um, the next one is from E R E Harrison. It says, "Is are there particular drivers to have a female or male mould and tooling? Is it constrained by the design or by the builder?" Um. To an extent, it's constrained by the design. If uh, so, if you think of a of a rudder, uh, the, the shape is it's a it's a foil section and it has to be perfect. So you would have a tendency to do a female mold. So you control this uh, outside shape the best you can. Uh, conversely, if you're trying to do uh, a part that fits around another part, you may want to control the inside shape. So you might do that around. Uh, a male part. Uh, so you've got those design consideration to go from the manufacturing constraints. Typically, a male mold is um, easier to fare and machine than or, or fabricate than a female mold. So within within reason, uh, it's, it's uh, a little bit cheaper to do a male mold and a little bit quicker. So uh, the, the TP52, we were able to do that in a female mold. If you start to do a hundred footer under uh, a time pressure, you probably go on a on a male mold and, and and make sure you end up with a fair surface by doing the right offsets. But uh, definitely, a male is weaker and 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 cheaper. Um, yep. 
Okay, the next one is from Eddie San, and it says, um, have you tried vacuum resin infusion for a boat that you were initially hand laminating? If so, did you have to redesign the layout sequence as uh, VRI requires less resin with reduced thickness and stiffness issue? That's right. So the, um, so the short answer is no, not in recent time because we have been using uh, uh, prepreg material for a number of decades. But um, the person asking the question is, is correct. Uh, the structure, the mechanical property of the composite material is a blend of the fiber and the resin. The reason we use prepreg is because that ratio has been optimized by the manufacturer. So when you come to us, we don't have to think about it twice. Uh, when, when you hand laminate, you rely on the skill of the shipwright to apply the right amount of, of resin and not have too much resin and not enough fiber, or conversely, too much fiber and not, not enough resin. Um, that, that would change the mechanical property. So if you speak to an engineer, he might uh, elect to increase his safety margin if he knows you're hand laminating versus prepreg. Um, and the uh, infusion is in between the two where it's still um, a wet laminate process, but it's a bit more control because as long as you can prove you have good vacuum, you know you'll have good cons consolidation and uh, a good resin to fiber ratio. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dave Lee says, is the prepreg composition custom at each order or is it a standard ratio between carbon and resin? There, there is an optimum, uh, there is an optimum ratio, and also there is a range the manufacturer gives you when they, um, the, the, you know, it's plus minus three percent, for example, uh, the the ratio they guarantee. So if you are in a America's Cup type of campaign, uh, you can ask the supplier to supply you only the role that fit their criteria, uh, but. O overall, um, it is pretty standard. Um, it can vary from one supplier to another. You've got some uh, prepreg that is uh, known as a bit drier, um, but um, there, the engineer should be able to tell you what the optimum ratio and the manufacturer will aim at that ratio. Are you working on any other projects other than boats? Yes. Is a short answer. We've been quite <laughs> fortunate that way since, uh, well, since forever. Uh, being a, a company specialist, um, we we've got all sorts of uh, uh, calls from different industries. So we, we are working with defense at the moment. Uh, we are involved with a, a race car uh, from the University of New South Wales uh, called SunSwift. That's a pretty cool project. It's a, a four seater. Um, electrical propulsion with solar uh, panels uh, on the roof, and that's uh, driven by the the students. Uh, they actually hear uh, laminating, uh, and again they selected composite material because well it needs to be light and stiff. So again that's a choice. We've done some work with the CSIRO for the astronomy branch. Uh, for the square kilometer away, we've done some work with the Sydney Opera House. Uh, we've done a submarine for James Cameron. Uh, I mean, that's just top of my head. But basically, people come to us with a problem. So, for example, um, they, they have an element they cannot build in, in steel because it's going to be too heavy or it might corrode or there's a specific set of um, constraint and they have to look further afield. Uh, if we're lucky in the engineering department, there's someone that knows about boats and knows about <coughs> carbon fiber and McConaughey and say, why don't we give McConaughey a call and see what they can do? Uh, that's often how we started our projects. Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, usual thank you bottle of wine will be delivered by an e-gift card. So that concludes this evening's presentation.